Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 10, Episode 59. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being with us this Monday, Steelers Nation. Dave, the old saying is, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. And that seems to be the state and the, the statement for the 2019 Pittsburgh Steelers as we go round and round once again with these guys. Yeah, uh, happy Festivus, Alex, and happy Immaculate Reception Day uh, on, on top of it. Could so. use a little magic right now, <laughs> that, that Franco Harris magic. Yeah, uh, uh, we're going to have plenty of airing of the grievances. <laughs> 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 what, what an appropriate day for that. And uh, yeah, uh, you... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit deeper here, but uh, yeah, if you do have two quarterbacks, you do have none. And uh, uh, right now, this team can't score any points. Uh, you know, one one touchdown uh, per game in seven of the last eight games, offensive touchdown. Mm. Uh, you're and, and despite the defense playing good and 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 keeping at the 17-16 magic number, uh, it's not enough. Nope. The Steelers' offense is averaging 12.7 points per game over their last seven weeks. The Steelers, despite holding every opponent under uh, over the last six weeks to under 21 points or 20 points and under in the last five, 17 or under, they're 3-3 three and three over that span. So really unusual stuff, but again, given the quarterback situation uh, and the state of this offense, it's not a surprise to see them struggle despite playing in low-scoring games, basically Every single week. I want to circle back though, Dave, before we jump too heavy into last uh, yesterday's loss to the Jets again. A 16-10 defeat puts the Steelers at eight and seven for the year. Uh, let's recircle back to what happened Friday after our podcast. Cam Kelly officially released after getting arrested Friday morning for resisting arrest and terroristic threats from an incident on the South Side at a bar. So he's gone. Marcus Allen promoted to the active roster uh, in his place. Was inactive for Sunday's game. Uh, Pretty pretty standard there. I'm not surprised by that, Cam Kelly. You know, when you're a fringe player like that, the margin for error is pretty pretty small. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't shocked, and they wasted no time in doing it. Boy, it just goes to show you how quick uh, decisions you make in your life can change your life <laughs> yep. uh, on a dime. And uh, unfortunate for him, but when when you know, as we talked, when you're when you're kind of those one of those fringe players like that, you don't have margin uh, for error, uh, especially when you when there's no salary cap. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, retro, uh, kick. What, what's the word? I'm Ooh, ramification. For? Ramification. There we go. It's too <laughs> early. Uh, no salary cap ramification there. Uh, you're a lot easier to to, uh, to kick right out the door there, and that's exactly what happened uh, with him. Just uh, slightly surprised uh, at 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 a few of the inactives there. Uh, you know, there was some talk talk about Arma Darbo uh, possibly being up this week uh, I thought maybe at first he wouldn't be and then I read a couple are I made a mistake and, and 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 trusted the media a little bit and and I said okay well maybe they will put him up there well uh, long long story short they did not uh, I thought okay with him uh, even if he even if he's up there's sure to be another running back that's down that didn't happen uh, basically the two inactives that were a little bit surprising for me were Marcus Allen because you figured he'd kind of be up on special teams to replace uh, a, a Cameron Kelly guy uh, and then uh, secondly uh, Isaiah Bugs uh, you know this is a team now that two weeks in a row uh, they have dressed or, or, or Last week they did not dress four uh, or did not dress five, all five defensive linemen. I thought, okay, well, maybe they'll, they'll go that way again. Well, uh, they didn't. They went ahead and dressed uh, Bugs and they put Darbo down. So those were kind of, you know, we're talking about things that really don't matter here. But uh, mm -hmm. just get, I like to get in the thought process sometimes and, and, and see, you know, try to work through why certain inactives were made. I'm not sure I can uh, uh give a good explanation for this one yeah a little surprised to see marcus allen down but i know in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter a whole lot what does matter is the injury report and i know generally this has been treated as a formality in a couple previous podcasts not today because dave there are some big names on the injury report Mar marquise pouncey with a left knee mason rudolph with a left shoulder james connor with a quad 
Pouncey's that did not look good uh, from my non-doctor perspective. Rudolph also probably didn't look good. He was in serious pain, and then Connor leaving again. Unfortunately, that's been the same story with him. Not every, not the shoulder injury again, but a new one, the quad. So a lot of injuries for the Steelers as they go into a critical Week 17 matchup with Baltimore. Again, you have a team that actually entered the weekend without any players on the status, you know, given status reports or given status designations, I, sh- I should say, for the game on Friday. That's the first time this season uh, that's that's happened <laughs> that they've you know come come out of a Friday with, with you know, nobody listed as questionable, doubtful, or out. Uh, not only is that a rarity for the Steelers, it's a rarity for a team in the NFL in general. You know, yeah, to, especially in Week 16. Right, especially in Week 16. So you think, okay, maybe is this a sign of something? You know, team getting uh, getting a really you know, technically, I guess you could say, as, as close. You know, look, they're not all 100% healthy, but as close mm-hmm. to healthy as they could possibly be when you're not get, given a designation, a status designation on a Friday injury report. That's that's uh, that's that's quite meaningful, if you ask me. Uh, but uh, yeah, you go into the game and then you come out of it. I'm with you. That Pouncey uh, injury did not look good right from the moment that I saw it, and then going back and looking at the replay a couple of times, uh, it, it 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 you know really didn't. And it looks like him uh, part of a kind of a pin, pin and pull uh, right there. He's working from center to the right side of the field, and you know it just looked like the foot maybe stuck in the mm-hmm. uh, stuck in the field turf, if you will. There, and then down you know uh, down he went and. When he was trying to come off the field on top of it, you know, uh, at first looked okay, and then kind of had that 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 kind of you know you know where you get that kind of feeling that runs up and down your spine for just a moment there. It looked like he had oh you know one one of those moments mm-hmm. there and stopped dead in his tracks there. Uh, we don't. Well, know. His, his left knee just kind of buckled, and right. he was walking off under his own power until that point. And once he felt it, something pop, he then put his arms around the trainers and had to be right. assisted off. So that is. A bad sign. Uh, this is just from a tweet. This isn't a, a full explanation from our Dr. Melanie Friedlander, but she had a tweet yesterday that said, quote, video isn't clear, but I'm worried about PCL and possibly ACL for Marquise Pouncey. Boy, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope she is too. But yeah, that one, but put it this way, I am not optimistic about him playing again in 2019. Yeah, I'm, I'm not either. And uh, the worst thing, too, about some of these, these ligament injuries and stuff that will require surgery when they happen so late, in in, mm-hmm. in in the season, you're you're automatically pushing way behind in, into the start of the next season. There, you know, right. didn't uh, that Keith Miller years ago towards ACL end of the year? Yeah, and uh, didn't uh, Mendenhall in like week 15 or week 16 uh, uh, do his knee as well? Uh, mm. It seems like, and so I mean, you can almost wipe them out for for OTAs at that point, and really uh, into the start of training camp. Because I think you know Kevin Colbert's been been a champion of saying any you know like especially an MCL or uh, you know, or AC. I forget if, you, if it was ACL or MCL. Anyway, he says the you know those typically need a full year. You know, c- kind of yeah, ACL. MCL would be more minor, but I, I, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, and we don't know what the injury. Yeah, is. yeah, we're, we're speculating, but I mean, look, it didn't look good, so mm-hmm. we're not. We'll probably get news either today or tomorrow by the time Mike Tomlin uh, talks and, and updates the injuries there. But uh, at, at the very least, we're not expecting to see him the rest of the season, and that rest of the season could be just one more, right. su- <laughs> one more Sunday anyway. There, but uh, uh, moving on from um, from Marquise Pound. You had uh, James Conner leave the game with, with what they're calling now a quad. Man, that guy just can't stay healthy, can he? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, shoulder, quad. You know, you, <clears throat> you know it, it seems like every week it, 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 it's something new with him when he does get back there. And, and you know, there was already an article. I've, I've written about it quite a bit, talking about his proven performance escalator <clears throat> and how he's unlikely to hit that. At this point, you know, PPG uh, was writing about, well, what's going to happen to him contract, you know, contractually during the offseason. They're trying to throw around some numbers in there. <laughs> uh, nope. uh, good luck, you know. Yeah. Not happen. Uh, good luck. At this point, he'll be he to, to at this point he'll be thankful to hit that that slight increase with the you know with the proven performance escalator, uh, because I just don't see right now how you can extend a guy that. Look, he when he's on the field, he's a great running back, man. I mean, mm-hmm. he he really is. But uh, and I'm not one that calls a guy injury or prone or anything like that. But you know, you gotta you gotta find a way. 
you got to show uh, you know at least a, uh, a a good stretch there of some games to stand on the field, and he's been uh, unable to do that. So going to be an interesting off season for him. And the last uh, player uh, that that I'm not talking about is who? Rudolph. Oh show. yeah, uh, comes in. <clears throat> boy, uh, uh, Pouncey leaves. BJ. <clears throat> boy, I got a frog in my throat this morning. Do you want to take Rudolph uh, here while you uh, get a chance? No, of water? no. He, uh, uh, you know, Rudolph comes in, uh, and then uh, uh, Finney follows Pouncey into the game, and then steps on, uh, proceeds to step on Rudolph's foot. Rudolph goes down, and I right then I was just saying, on his way down, he's trying to hand off that ball to Benny Snell, and I'm thinking, my God, what are you doing? You know, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, once he is down and they missed a handoff, I was thinking to myself, man, just stay down. Uh, and he didn't. He tried to get up, and they uh, they drove him back down right on that. Uh, that would be his left shoulder, I think. Yep. And <clears throat> you could tell right then at that moment he you know he was he was not good. Uh, I think he there was the one other. I think there was the third down play after that, and then exited the game, uh, and then did not come in. And boy, he was in some pain on the sideline. Because uh, you look, I mean, he had to be in some pain to leave that game after getting a chance to come back, mm-hmm. uh, come back into it there. And then after the game, they said, you know, he was, he was, he seemed to be in pain and then left with that, uh, at that arm in a sling there. So, uh, you know, Mike Tomlin, you know, kind of hedging his bets, like, or, or you know, kind of saying, look, you know, the, the quarterback situation next week's up in the air because we got a guy dealing with an injury, so to speak. Uh, it's not looking, you know, at least it is his non throwing shoulder, you know, but even so, it, it, it looks like he separated that thing. Yeah, uh, did not look good. Uh, would be probably hard to envision him playing in Week 17, especially with, with a, a assumption of limited practice reps for whatever injury he has. With Connor, yeah, no no question that, that James Connor is the most talented running back on this roster. He's also, unfortunately, the hardest running back to trust. And I'm not going to make light. I know some people have on the internet about his injury history and, 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 and all the injuries that are piled up with him. I'm not going to make fun of that. He's an incredibly tough dude that's beaten cancer and I'm sure is frustrated more than anybody else by his own, you know, repeated injuries, but he's just a hard guy to commit any sort of long-term investment in. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not making light of it, too. I wish he was no, healthy, you know, I know. Uh, yeah. uh, as well. I'm with you on that. And uh, it, it's unfortunate because he is such a, you know, such a good running back when he is healthy and out there. But, uh, man, you miss three here, you miss, you know, two here, you miss whatever. You know, those things add up there. And then, plus, you don't have the consistency of having that same guy in the backfield. And overall, look, I know for three games they were able to get by with kind of this running back committee. I really wish that they were either using him all the time or that th- the three that they were doing in the same manner that they did during that three-game stretch. Uh, mm-hmm. other- otherwise, it looks like, man, they-, they just all out of sorts back there uh, in the backfield. Since Connor has come back the last two games, the running game has been you know, miserable, you yep. know. Uh, on top of it, and, and and they've needed that running game to take the pressure off the quarterbacks, and they just haven't gotten it. So, uh, look, I don't, you know, I, I you got to go in to me. You got to go into this off season with with Connor, unless he's willing to take peanuts, uh, which I doubt he's willing to do. You know, they're talking about, you know, I, I forgot what that PPG article said, but you know, ten, eleven, or whatever, twelve million. Yeah, good luck with that, my, my man. Uh, yeah. Good luck with, with even half of that right now. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Still paying a guy six million dollars to, to sit out, you know, six games a year is not smart. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't see them doing anything with Connor, but but you said out of sorts with the run game, out of sorts for the entire offense. So let's jump into this game, Dave. Again, the Steelers lose 16-10 to to the New York Jets, and out of sorts is the way to describe this offense. And I guess really in hindsight, I know it's easy to, to look back on these things in this way. You know, the Jets had a really stout run defense and a bunch of pressure packages and a, and a blitz-heavy team that could really get after the quarterback. That's really the worst case scenario for the Steelers offense because their whole mantra is be able to to run the ball effectively to keep keep them on schedule and just avoid some of those you know heavy blitz looks and I just thought overall the run game wasn't there consistently enough certainly not the, the case after James Conner left and then you get yourself into third and longs and then Greg Williams does does his thing and again I thought the Steelers really struggled to adjust and a lot of the issues I saw against Buffalo I saw against the Jets and that's that's a real uh, bad sign for the coaching staff because I thought this was a, the game that Spotlight was going to be on Sean Surrett and on the offense as a whole. How could they adjust? Could they create answers to the problems that they dealt with last week? And I thought for, for the most part they failed. 
Yeah, I, I did as well. And look, I don't think we saw anything surprising out of the Jets' defense overall. The things that we kind of previewed and all uh, talking in, you know, going into the game, it was just whether or not you know we thought maybe the Steelers would make the corrections, especially some of of of, of handling the, the blitz packages and all like that. And once again, they didn't. You mm-hmm. know, for 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 the most part. Now, obviously, uh, the Steelers did not help themselves by being in third and long situations a lot uh, most of the game. But, you know, they, they you know, overall, I, and here's what I calculated, 10 of the Steelers' 14 third downs they faced were seven yards or longer. Okay? Mm. Man, that's that's a ton. Yep. You know, you want to talk about being behind the schedule, and I think there was only one of them that was seven, and then the rest of them were longer than even seven there. So, you know, you're, you're, you're putting obviously obvious pass situations, uh, uh, you know, that many times on third downs, you're going to face what you face from 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 Greg Williams, and I thought they did a good job of showing one thing and and drop you know uh, mixing up of who they're going to drop. But but even so, the Steelers once once they kind of could identify, and even some of those were kind of delayed, if you will, uh, guys coming, and they still couldn't even pick those up. Matt Filer once again, at least for, it looked like uh, had an issue of trying to to work uh, outside in, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Jets ran very similar inside linebacker and DB, mostly with their safety, Jamal Adams, blitzes the Buffalo ran last week. It was basically the same thing against six-man protection. Same issues last week happened this week. That's unacceptable. I mean, you have to be able to counter that. They didn't. It, it happened on the Hodges interception. happened on that Filer, uh, the Rudolph sack that the Filer screwed up, uh, that you reference. I mean, that's just – it's unbelievable that they couldn't adjust to that. Yeah, I mean, but these – we're not talking about a bunch of uh... – you know, rookies or, or third year mm-hmm. guys in there either. You know, right. so yeah, it uh, so, uh, some of it does go on Surratt, You know, sure, uh, because he. I mean, that's that's a position coach. Uh, but I mean, at, how much of this goes on? You know, the, these offensive linemen as well too. You could coach it, coach it up to you to, to your blue in the face sometimes. Mm-hmm. But, but if they don't execute and follow simple, you know, uh, uh, standard practices, if you will. Uh, I mean, what, what, you throw your arms up at that point. I mean, this is not. It, it'd be more to. It'd be easier to put on more on more on threat. Look, I'm not letting them off because the last two weeks have been absolutely miserable. But you're dealing with an extremely veteran uh, offensive line, and these guys have played together a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the blame's on both. I'm not saying it's just on Surrett, though. I think from a schematic standpoint, there have still been problems. I think against Fowler's playing a really rough. Uh, two games. So she was awesome. I mean, the first half of the season. Sure was. The, and then boy, the last two, man, just, uh, well, I don't know. He's trying to, he, once again, we talked about last, you know, last week, he's trying to do too much. Mm-hmm. You know, look, if that's not your guy, it's not your guy. I mean, I wonder, I know he played 10 games last year, but this is the first year he's played a full 16 game slate. So I wonder if it's just a mental wear down associated with just kind of doing it for the first time to, to this extent, playing this many snaps because he did come in basically midway through last season. So I think it's something to consider. But I mean, he's been it's, it's been poor. Um, and again, just the same issues to plague them against the Bills, plague them against the Jets. Uh, it's been issues with, with player and individual assignment technique stuff and then coaching issues still abound. This is the first time in a while I've been worried about the Steelers offensive line. Foster, I did not, did not think had a good game. Pouncey snap continues to be poor. Then he threw the injury on top. I mean, I, th- there are some real question marks with this line that I haven't thought about in a long time. It's it's a lot easier, so I guess, uh, to to digest sometimes when you see a free runner like a uh, like a, a safety or a corner or maybe a linebacker or something like that. But Quin, 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 Quin Williams, <laughs> how, how do you let him run free? Yeah, you know? well, I, I think they blitzed the linebacker and Foster have taken the linebacker. No one had Williams. That was the the sack on the second down play, right? Late, yeah, about. it was the later later in the game there, uh, or yeah. it was it was one. It was actually on Hodges, right after Hodges right. had returned to the game. Right, uh, is that was I think they were trying to do because that was a roll to the right. They were trying to do that throwback tight end play mm-hmm. that they ran against Cleveland on fourth down in the first Cleveland matchup. You remember that one? Mm-hmm. That was incomplete, and that was the same one that they had run to Xavier Grimble in last year's game against Denver. Denver. So for the outcome, granted that play worked, it was a good play call because Grimble got open, but the outcome for those three plays have been Grimble fumble at the goal line, turned over, giving back to Denver, uh, incomplete against Cleveland earlier this year, then they sacked it and ended up taking it at a field goal range. So uh, maybe it's time to scrap that one because they aren't ending too well for Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah, especially when you don't block it up, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was aggravating. 
Uh, and look, even on uh, you know the the, the pressure uh, early in the game uh, forced Hodges to, to maybe throw a ball that he didn't really want to throw, and and that mm-hmm. was that was picked off uh, there. So yeah, once again, look, the Jets didn't do anything at least you know pre pre all twenty two tape anything you know uh, off the charts there. Uh, they they the Steelers just couldn't handle it there yep. and uh i thought that the Steelers might have be able to have some success running to the left side uh they did they had four of their four of their runs were successful to that left but uh uh just not enough overall run consistency overall gets a good run defense and you know when when you're in when you when you consistently put yourself in the 10 of the uh 14 third downs that were uh, seven or yards or longer with with those court, you know, with your quarterback situation, you ju- you're just asking for yep. it. That, that just just again unacceptable. They were three of fourteen on third down. No surprise given the stat you just laid out. They're twenty nine percent on third down over the last two weeks. This was a third down offense already that hovered around twenty fifth in football. I'm sure they're a couple spots lower now. I could check here in a little bit what where they rank uh, currently, but yeah, you you got to stay on schedule. You can't be in third and long given the offense, given the defense you're facing, the pressure scheme. So the Jets are going to throw at you, um, and the quarterbacks obviously didn't help themselves so I guess that's kind of a, a good time to segue into the quarterback play Devlin Hodge just got the start and just like Mason Rudolph against the Bengals weeks ago threw two first half picks or Rudolph I think only threw one but same point turn the football over and that's enough to get your bench as it should be the offense has and I wrote about this last week Dave the offense has one mission and one mission only don't turn the football over and they cannot figure that out for the life of them what's the streak now 22 games of a yeah turnover? unfortunately 22 yep it's, keep racking up that number so again Hodges did the one thing he couldn't do which which was turn it over and they were both pretty costly the first one came with the Steelers driving a pretty good what, initial drive they get in, in Jets territory and first and 10 play pressure forces the pick gets picked off by Basham they, they dropping outside linebacker on that little zone blitz scheme and then the other one just a terrible throw to try to throw it in the corner of the end zone for Jalen Samuels gets picked off by Marcus May you take points off the board potentially a difference in the game so you do that and you get benched and I have no no problem with that. Yeah, you know, look, they didn't they didn't result in putos like I like to call them. Uh but uh they took you out of situations where it looked like maybe you're going to get some points on each of those drives. Mm-hmm. You know, and even Lord knows even six more points. Uh I don't know, I do the math there. That that would have been a uh, if you do the math if you do the math on six more points there, then maybe maybe that thing's you know going into overtime or whatnot, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, yeah, they uh, uh, th- those were those are costly, and those things will get you pulled. And you just had you just had the feeling after kind of the start that he had, uh, and then that that second interception, you kind of knew what was coming there. And the, and the good and then the thing about it was when Mason Rudolph came in, he 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 he, he provided him a little bit of a spark there, you know. Yeah. Uh, I thought uh, even. Uh, what was it? The uh, 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 the third down throw that he had made uh, to to get them kind of back in field goal range. I put on Twitter. I said, "Circle that one." Uh, that was you know, it, it might not seem like a significant play, but it was uh, to get them back in field goal range. And they got a field goal there. And then of course you turn around and, and and you get the deep touchdown, which beautiful pass by him. Uh, and I don't know what mm-hmm. the, what the Jets defense yeah. was was thinking in that situation there, but but they let uh, Deontay Johnson get behind him there in that situation. You you're thinking that at your point at, at that point, at least I was. I'm thinking, okay, well, all right, well maybe he got a few things figured out here. Uh, well, that didn't last long because then he then he winds up getting injured. Yeah, I mean, no, Rudolph looked good in relief. Something about him coming off the bench apparently is the secret to his success. You saw the Seattle game. You saw what All happened. Right. Yesterday, yeah, 14 for 20, 129 yards, one touchdown, no picks. Uh, he was decisive. There was velocity on his football. He was able to take shots deep, and I thought had good accuracy. Yeah, the touchdown to, to Deontay Johnson under the half was great. Um, and it felt like it felt like at that moment you were going to get a classic Steelers game when you were down early, which has been the story almost every game this year. You claw your way back into half with a late drive, and you can try to double dip because you're you're going to get the ball at halftime again. You think about the Miami game, what the Bengals game. Others, I'm sure I'm forgetting right now, have a similar story, and it uh, just didn't work out. If Rudolph, if Rudolph did, had stayed healthy and didn't get hurt, I think the Steelers win this one. Yeah, I kind of think that as well too. If he, uh, uh, yeah, I think we at least maybe we go to overtime. 
you know, in, mm-hmm. in, in this one. But uh, I, I, after being, you know, after seeing what we saw up until he came into the game and then seeing what we saw after he came into the game, even losing Pouncey, you know, at that point, I was thinking, okay, maybe, you know, maybe they still got this here. But uh, once he left and, and Hodges had to come back in, I, you know, it's like letting the air out of the balloon at that time. Yeah. Because uh, if this, uh, look, uh, I imagine there's a lot of duck suits being returned. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to return these dozen duck calls, please. Uh, I mean, the, the big sequence for me was the Steelers, and this is even after Rudolph got hurt. The Steelers have second and seven. The Jets twenty nine is a thirteen ten game. Ten minutes left to go. Uh, again, second and seven. Jets twenty nine. You get a sack, which was the play we talked about a moment ago makes it third sixteen. Then you have the bad snap by Finney. You lose eight more yards, you're in fourth and 24. So you go from the Jets 29 to the second and seven. Now you're fourth and 24, the Jets 46, you have to punt. I mean, you you would have tied the game up there without Boston's kicking. He's going to make that field goal, and who knows what happens from there. End up Jets going on a pretty decent drive, get another field goal to make it 16 dent uh, off that Steelers punt. That was the difference in the game. So even with, you know, Hodges back in a quarterback, even if you just run the ball twice in that situation on that second and seven, you tie it up, who knows what happens from there. So, so many chances, so many self-inflicted wounds. This offense continues to find ways to lose games. Yeah, and look, I, you know, I don't know how much we're going to talk about the defense in this show, but uh, I, out, outside of the opening drive, you know, which, uh, look, you got to give it to the – you know, the impressive thing about the Jets is the Steelers came out uh, w- wanting to get after him, you know, with, mm-hmm. with, with some pressures and all like that. And I thought they did a tremendously good job of getting the football out of, you know, Sam Darnold uh, kind of identify some of those things, having the hots in place and making sure that they got, got the football out of his hands. You know, yeah. uh, in, in those situations, and not only that, they they seemingly uh, did a good job. The Jets, at least early in the game, of, of staying ahead of the chains. You know, four four yard runs on first down mean a lot. You know, uh, and if they weren't doing that, they were getting four to seven via via pass, and then letting Bell uh, pick up the first down on the second down, which which he was doing. Uh, I, you know, going into this game, I, I you know I think we all knew that their game plan should should be to get the football in the hand of, of Le'Veon Bell as as much as earthly possible, and and they and they did that, and I thought they did a good job of doing that. Now, obviously, they marched down the field. You don't like to see that uh, uh, on that opening drive there. And then uh, you obviously don't want like to see that long touchdown. Uh, what a treme- tremendous great throw by Sam mm-hmm. Darnold. And we talked about, or at least I did talk about, uh, boy, strong hands that Robbie Anderson uh, has. And he really needed them on, on that play. Uh, kind of bracket coverage, if you will. And uh, I don't know. One of them looked like they didn't know who was going to have over the top of them. But uh, uh, right down the seam they go. And uh, you, you turn around and it's 7 nothing down. Yeah, I, I mean, it was a great throw, great catch, but man, you you bracket their best player, their their best receiver, uh, and you still give that up. I mean, I don't know what more you could have done. Maybe Edmund should have taken a better angle, got more depth initially, but yeah, that one was was a killer. I guess I mean sometimes you got to tip your hat, but once again, once you have a guy bracketed like that, it means you're taking mm-hmm. him away, and if you still get beat in, in that situation, look, it was a great throw. Um, uh, I, I'm not even sure if, 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 uh, uh, Hayden's a little bit more on top, if he even gets to that and, you know, uh, Robbie Anderson made a great catch on it, but I guess the best thing about it is you give up seven right away and you only gave up what nine more via field goals the rest mm-hmm. of the way. Now, as you said, probably the most kind of depressing drive there was the one after, you know, they went backwards. The Steelers went backwards when it looked like they were going to get a field goal there. Then having to punt and then allowing them to kind of come down and get into field goal range. That was probably uh, the other kind of depressive defensive series, if you will. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There, there were pockets where obviously defense could have played better. Again, they tried to blitz, and I thought, as you said, Donald countered the blitz very well. But to go back to the offense, just to kind of finish that, you know, push section of the ball up. I mean, they just can't do anything. I, I don't know what more this defense can do at this point. The, the only touchdown the Steelers scored was set up by the T.J. Watt strip sack that uh, gave them a short field and, and, and try to swing momentum before the end of the first half. But this offense, you just can't trust them to do anything. I mean, trying to throw the ball consistently, they can't even snap the ball consistently. I mean, it, just the fundamentals of football they're failing at, and I just I just don't know how, how to really fix it aside from wait till Ben comes back next year. 
And look, uh, they got away with one of those bad snaps as well, too. To thank, thank goodness for what was a false start in that mm-hmm. situation. If not, that's probably going to be a turnover uh, or, at worst, he'll lose nine yards uh, in, yep. in, in, in that situation there. And Mike Tomlin kind of, you know, pawned that off, uh, you know, just brushing up underneath the rug when, when, that, when talked about it with Pouncey. You know, last week there, and you know it, it it continues on, and not only that, now you got Finney, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, w- 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 with with some bad snaps as, as well too. So so that needs to become, it's a big deal, and and and, and just because Ben's back there covering it up doesn't make it okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know why this team has kind of downplayed the issue when it's clearly been an issue. It's causing a lot of problems for this offense. I think, again, evident Sunday against the Jets. So uh, it was maybe some bright spots for the offense to be a little little uh, holiday cheer here. I thought Deontay Johnson had another good game. He's talking about how he's hitting the rookie wall, but he's not showing it on the field. Kareth White giving the run game a little bit of juice. Maybe it's most uh, success after Connor exited. Uh, and then uh, to go back to the Jets, I, I just Speaking of giving them credit, uh, I got to give Marcus May the safety credit. I mean, he made two game-changing plays Sunday. A, the pick, uh, the second interception from Hodges in the end zone. That was a great play. And then B, you know, Hodges, for all his warts, threw a pretty decent ball in that, that, that you know, 44 seconds left to James Washington that Washington nearly caught, but May made a tremendous play to play the pocket and break that one up. Um, so, I mean, give give credit to the Jets. May's a high pedigree guy. Uh, came from Florida, I think a third round pick, I believe. And uh, he, he, he really, I think, kind of saved the game for New York. Yeah, I do. I, I do as well, too. Boy, that one, you know, we, we, I, I talk about James Washington all the time with those those uh, those man hand lobster crackers of his that he has. Uh, if he if he that thing kind of separates one time, you know, his hands come back open just slightly for a moment there that's when may i think gets his his uh his hand in there too uh, good players make good plays right and mm-hmm. uh you know uh, uh, i'm not i'm not saying that that's one that uh look I, you you got to if you make that you win the game yep. I, all right and uh you two players battling battling for that if you get your hands on it, a lot of times you should probably, uh, and especially with him, someone as good at hands, I've seen him make that catch a, a, quite a few times, kind of in college, you know, kind of that same position as well too. Uh, you you got to make that catch, you know. Obviously, made just made a phenomenal play on top of it, so you got to give him some credit on there. But it was a good ball; it was right there. It was a catchable football, and just one of those that you kind of wish that you had over, right? And yep. uh, uh, even so, I, I'm not so sure if May doesn't rip that one out again uh, the next time. So learning experience there. But once again, if you're going to be an elite wide receiver in the NFL, you 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 come come down with that one. And I you know I don't know how many different times I, you know you've looked at the the angle on the juju one. Looked mm-hmm. like he just kind of misjudged the football a little bit, mistimed his jump, and the ball was a little bit kind of over his back over his head a little bit there, but. But in that situation, once again, game on the line, you know, uh, you know, if you if you put him in that same opportunity 24 hours later, does he make the catch? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I know Juju's taking the loss hard and, and, and trying to shoulder all the blame, and obviously it's not all his fault. That was a tough play. I mean, I know it, it, play, it was a tough one. Look, it's, it's uh, to me that's more of a kind of a tougher catch than what James Washington had, you know, because at least it it was kind of fl- more flush in Washington's hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, with Juju, he's kind of going back up over his head, and it was a little bit high though. Uh, to me, it looks like he kind of mis misjudged it, misjudged the. Uh, uh, you know, the jump and all like that as well, too. But yeah, I think with that one, obviously, when you slow down, it looks like he should have had it. It should have been an easy play. But that ball was just such a floater in the air that it was just hard to judge where it was going to land because I think Hodge just got hit or just kind of threw. It was it was the bad snap, actually. He had just kind of had right. to abort and just kind of chuck it up there. So you're trying to judge it, you know, and, and it's very high. It's just kind of a, a fly ball you're trying to deal with. I mean, could, could Juju made that play? Absolutely. Will he say that he should have made that play? Uh, he did. And, and, uh, and I get that. But that was probably a lot tougher than, than how it looked when you slow it down and you zoom in and all that because you're trying to judge the flight of that ball while you're running. Um, that, that that one's kind of difficult. But, I mean, obviously a tough game for Juju. Had that one great catch on third down, but had a drop, and clearly a guy that, that played through some pain. I'm not sure what his snap count was, but uh, he only saw, what, four or five targets, and 
Um, you know, a guy that's obviously not fully healthy or anywhere close to being fully healthy. Right, and he, boy, he's going to, you know, he, look, he had tears in his eyes last night. And, mm-hmm. uh, he, you know, he's, uh, for certain people in the media, he's an easy target, you know. Uh, and, uh, he, you know, he's just a, he's a fun-loving kid uh, trying to do the right things and trying to make, make, you know, make some money on top of it. I don't have any issue with that. But what you're going to see here now, and you're already starting to see it a little bit there, he, he's starting to get beaten down a little bit, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, start, it's starting to wear on him mentally of what people think of him, uh, what some people think of him off the field. He's just going to have to, you know, he's going to have to know that not everybody, you know, is, like me, <laughs> Not everybody's going to like you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, a lot of people are not going to like you. <laughs> but but look, you just got to push through it. You know, you are who you are. Uh, you can't, you know, look, he's not, to me, he's not doing anything egregious. People say he's out, you know, hopping in a bunny suit and going to, to dances and all like that. I don't see anything egregiously wrong with that. I mean, if you're out on a hockey rink or something, you know, we talked about him, and I don't even know what that was about. I don't know if it was a commercial or or appearance or what. You know, if you're doing anything that's obviously putting your body in a lot of harm, you know, that that that's one thing. But uh, to go out and do appearances and, and play video games online, and, you know, people think these guys should just sit at home for 22 hours, and, and, and if they can't play, keep their keep their uh, mind buried in the playbook. That's just not the reality of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, here, uh, the guy's a good player. Did he have a did, did he have a good season? Absolutely not. I mean, w- with the injury and with, with you know several other plays that he didn't make this year, uh, he is kicking himself. And I I bet uh, I bet he's re- really you know down going to be really down on himself the rest of this week and on thinking about this play late in this game against the Jets as well too. But the problem is the, what I'm most worried about him right now is fun loving Juju's not going to be fun loving Juju much longer. Mm-hmm. I think the best thing for him is just for the season to end and just to kind of get away from it all and reset and just punt on this year and say it was a terrible year, you know, for a lot of reasons, injury, you know, play that probably wasn't up to his standard that factored in by some injury and health concerns. Uh, it, it, when it comes to the off the field stuff, he, here's the way that I try to look at it and frame it in order to be as consistent as possible. I, I ask myself, you know, if Juju was playing well, if he was having an unbelievably good season like last year, would I care about? whatever social media thing that's getting, you know, cakes on, on Twitter about. And if the answer to that question is no, I wouldn't care. Then, then I, I, then I can realize, okay, this is a dumb thing to talk about. I'm not going to comment on it because I'm not going to let how well you're playing on the field dictate my opinion of you off the field and what you should and should not be doing. So, but if it's something I wouldn't care about, if you were playing great, then I know it's something that is not meaningful to talk about and not to comment on. So I I try to stay away from that stuff to begin with, because who cares? It's all dumb social media, you know, hot takes, whatever. But, um, yeah, I'm not going to dictate Juju what to do in his personal life, um, even if he's not having a good year, because you should be able to separate professional versus personal. And, look, the more visible that you are, the more the, the, the bigger the target you are. You know? Sure. And he's, 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 he's done a good job of marketing himself, and he is a, a, a premier social media, high-profile Steelers player, if you will. So when you do that, you're going you know, uh, to have your critics anyway. Uh, uh, you know, and then when, when you don't make plays, people are going to easily go for the easy, most visible target a lot of times. And right now it's him. Uh, now, uh, you know, the whole, sp- uh, uh, recording him going fast on the, uh, uh, on the freeway a couple, couple weeks ago, that was just stupid. Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's one of those things where I say, okay, if he was having a good season, would I care about him going 104 on the freeway? Yes, I would. Because I think anyone doing that's going to put themselves and others in harm's way. So I think that's something to be critical of. It's not the worst thing in the world. I think most people have driven fast in their life, but that's obviously a, just a dumb thing to drive that fast in general. And B, of course, to post it on social media is also uh, not a good idea. Right. You know, there's, I don't, you know, I, I hope he remains the fun loving kind of kid, but look, here, here's the thing too. <laughs> Grow, growing up sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something Sometimes uh, you hit those points in life where you think, man, I didn't know it was going to be like this, you know, and I think he's kind of at, at at one of those points right now. And unfortunately, I think it's going to change him uh, a little bit. I mean, we're already seeing it sometimes in the locker room, him kind of being, you know, shorter 
uh, shorter with the, with the questions and, and and all like that, not being the kind of the same happy go lucky juju, if you will. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and and I think he's starting to get beat down a little bit. I think it is starting to affect him a little bit mentally. And when it does that, it's, it, it probably is going to affect you to to some degree uh, on the field. So yeah, he's just gonna have to do a better job of maybe, you know, who he needs to go spend some time with the great Larry Fitzgerald. <laughs> yeah, you know, Larry Legend. We'll uh, give him a couple of clues about growing up uh, in 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 the NFL, uh, and I think he needs I, I think he needs some of that right now. I think he needs him a good mentor uh, right now. Look, the the guy's extremely talented. Uh, he he's obviously hadn't had the season that he wants to have this year. People saying and 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 you know people saying you know not not a number one receiver doesn't deserve number one money. Well, well that might be the case. He, he, there's a good chance he's going to get paid to some degree. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, probably not what, you know, maybe, maybe not top 10 or definitely not top five money, you know, this, this off season, but he's probably going to get paid, especially when somebody like, uh, James Conner might not be, but I uh, just circling back to how all this fits into the game. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, it, it's a ball that I don't know. Eight times out of a ten, does he catch that? I don't know, but uh, uh, he is taking it hard. It was a key point in the game, as was the uh, one that James Washington. And look, Juju seems to think maybe that if he catches this, he goes into the end zone. I'm not so sure mm. if, yeah. if, if that's the case, but it does at least give put him down there, you know, in 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 red zone situation there where, where maybe they do. But I, maybe that's enough talking about Juju and mm-hmm. Juju off the field and on the field. Yeah, best thing for him, just, you know, let the season come to a close and bounce back in 2020. The uh, rest of the group, again, Deontay Johnson, like what he did. Tight ends, I know Vinette got a little bit more involved, but it's just, talk about punting on a situation. This tight end group just hasn't given you anything close to what you needed this season. Yeah, look, I, I circle back now, too, uh, with, with, with Vance. You know, I, I don't know if I keep him, Alex, especially if I think that I want. Uh, I tell you two guys in the last uh, several weeks that I'm not so sure now that I keep that I could free up that money for uh, for some bud, you know, to help. Is, is Foster one of them? Yeah, Foster's yeah. one of them, and uh, uh, Vance. Vance McDonald's the other one, man. I you know, and those guys aren't killing you left to right. I mean, uh, top to bottom when it comes to actual dollar. But when you need those dollars mm-hmm. and you're looking at where they are in their careers and how they might potentially fit in and help you in 2020, man, there was, I don't know if you saw the one sequence with Foster going down the field. Uh, he just, he, he looked sloppy, you know. On a screenplay? Uh, uh, I think it was, yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean, looked, I'm sure he's never moved gracefully. Right, the, right, but looked, he, he looked old man. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and yeah, I think it might, I, I'm not, I'm not convinced of keeping him right now. Uh, and you know, the thing with him, normally when we talk about Ramon Foster at the end of either, either in the middle of the season or at the end of the season, the one word we always tend to go circle back to with him is just, man, he's just consistent, you know? Mm-hmm. Now I'm, I can't, I don't think I can say that about him right now. And you want to talk about a guy that's not overly great. Uh, and then you're not able to even say to use some of the adjectives just to describe him like you used to, then maybe it, it is time, you know, mm-hmm. uh, no, it's, him. It's, it's, it's a fair case to make. Uh, I'm, I'm more open to it than I thought I would be, uh, certainly compared to the start of the year. Now, would that be the idea of bringing Finney back or would it be you know, what I suggested of kicking Filer inside and starting Chooks at right tackle? Yeah, look, I look because I, I, I think the latter is more realistic from a from just a cost perspective. You're cutting Foster to save money. Resigning Finney is going to just eat that space up, and then probably then some. So I think from a you know what makes sense in uh, cap wise, I think you can probably kick Fowler to left guard and have a core four starter right tackle next year. And if you did resign uh, uh, Finney, how how much better does it make you, and for how long? You know? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously this team didn't like him enough to start him against the Rams where they decided to kick Fowler inside. So I think they know this, there are some limitations there. So, yeah, point take. So, yeah, I think maybe you and, – and now you throw in on top of it, man, filer has been – you know, uh, maybe he is a guard playing tackle, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, as of late. Uh, 
I really think that you – and I, I wrote this way back, I think, in my salary cap kind of look ahead. Guys like Foster and – uh, who else did I have in there? Well, Chicolo's gone. Yeah, I mean... Uh, you mentioned you, a Lulu potential. Right, well, let me tell you, you want to talk about a guy that really has got me thinking the other way uh, about, about him right now is a mm-hmm. Lulu. Jeez. I think, I think you keep Tyson. I don't yeah. Think yeah, I don't think there's any 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 question about it uh, with him right now. You got to keep it, especially at the low low cost that he mm-hmm. is. And losing uh, Hargrave and Tuit coming back, I think you got to hold on to a little. Yeah, bit. absolutely. Uh, I you know, I still think uh, uh, I think you kind of push back when, with the talk about Foster uh, initially. I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, but uh, now now not you know. Now I think both of us are in agreement. You gotta take a hard, uh, hard look at that right now, especially if you're wanting to carve out this money to keep Dupree. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I, I think now you really, you, you, it's evident that you have to try to do that. So, uh, what, 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 what it will be in the meantime while you groom another guard, who knows? But yeah, it makes sense to what you said to take Filer, kick him on over into left guard. Let uh, Chooks or Banner or whoever, you know, kind of battle over there. But in the same instance, and, and you know, we'll see what this knee injury does to Pouncey as well, too. Uh, mm-hmm. get, get you a guard guard center type is going to be way up there. And and I think even prime to, to where potentially where the Steelers' first, first selection in the draft will ultimately be. It'll be in that key. We can get a top guard or center here kind of area. Yeah, my loose plan was if you move on from Foster, again, you move Fowler inside the left guard, probably a core four starts at right tackle, then you're drafting an interior lineman, I would probably say third round, maybe with that third round comp pick, you'll get back from for Bell is kind of my rough off-season plan. Yeah, and you should be able to get one second or third round, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure what the depth is, how good it is this year, but it usually has some names and, and some versatile guys, which will be in the Steelers' wheelhouse. But but, but back to the Jets game, uh, just to finish up the offense again. The run game, not good well, enough. We went, went, down, we went yeah. down a rabbit hole, didn't we? Do <laughs> uh, you really want to talk about this game? I don't. It's just, it's just yeah. bad. Really, I mean, go with the offense. We can talk about the X's and O's and, and, and all the, the detailed breakdowns. I mean, I, I know that's our thing to do, but the offense is just bad. I mean, and this offense was even just – Below average, I mean, just slightly below average, they could win. I mean, they would have won against Buffalo. They would have beat the Jets yesterday. I mean, you could you could make it work with how good this defense has been. But th- this offense is worse than below average. They are just bad. And when you t- turn the football over as much as they have been and as consistently as they do and as in such inopportune times to give the football away, like in chances where you're about to get a field goal and taking yourself out of field goal range with sacks and bad snaps later on in the game in key moments, I mean – it's not it, – There's you don't need a high level of nuance to understand the offensive, offensive issues here. They're just bad in almost every area. Yeah, and it starts at the quarterback position, though, too, yep. you know. Yep. Uh, and I, I think hopefully people, listeners to the show are, are seeing now that, you know, uh, no matter how good offensive play, play call or maybe you have it sometimes, there are – there are some deficiencies at some de- at some positions that you just can't hide, and quarterback is definitely one of them. Man, uh, you just you just can't hide that stuff over time. And I keep going back, and I retweeted this last night. You know, uh, uh, Next Gen Stats had the the, the early kind of comparisons of Devlin Hodges and and Mason Rudolph, but the glaring difference in those things were pressure percentages <laughs> in between the two. Well, you know what? Teams decided the last several times out with Devlin. Well, let's see how this kid does with pressure. Uh, and I think we're finding out now, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and you know, they're all, and they're going to continue to do that until he proves, uh, proves, you know, he, he can, he can, he can handle it. And I guess long story short, what I'm getting back to is people just think that you just bring any quarterback in at times, uh, you know, if they're not Ben Roethlisberger, they're not Ben. It just goes to show you how good of damn player that Roethlisberger is, and it goes back to his ability to extend the plays, uh, uh, his, his ability to 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 uh, you know we kid him all the time about you know, Ben likes his guy college open, uh, but Ben will still uh, uh, throw to the middle of the field and and tight window you know aspects of it as well too. He'll you he does a good job of reading. 
reading and going through his reads because he knows he has time because he knows he can he can extend a play. Uh, well, you know those people that 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 have been writing in or been talking about. Well, maybe we can uh, move on from Ben Roethlisberger. Maybe Duck uh, uh, it, it can can be the guy. No. Uh, <laughs> That, that's not how it works. At this point right now, what are you saying to yourself at the quarterback position? Well, at least Rudolph maybe showed us a little bit something to maybe to to uh, reinvest investigate there. But uh, other than that, I mean, I mean, are you starting Paxton Lynch against the Ravens? Uh, I assume Rudolph's not going to be available. So now you're down to Duck versus Lynch. I'm still probably going with Duck just because. I mean, he's gotten the reps. I know they haven't been pretty the last two weeks, but there were, there have been positives in his game. And Lynch, I think, is just – I mean, he, how many reps has he gotten in game experience? You know, none in, in years. I'm still probably going to go with Hodges. Yeah. I don't know if it matters really. But yeah, I, mean, I don't think – that's right. That's <laughs> right. You stole it. You stole it from me there. I don't think it – you know, a polished turd is still a turd. <laughs> right, right. Hey. Yeah, you can, put four, you can put that fake 14-karat gold on it, but – uh, it's still a turd, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or I could use another, some other colorful words that my old man used to use, <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, well, let me shift the conversation to Feetner here. Uh, well, so we don't get uh, in trouble. Uh, oh, who's going to get us in trouble? Nobody, I guess I should say, but, but with Feetner again, I, I, was it a great game from Feetner? Probably not. I mean, I'm sure you can go back and look at a lot of play calls. The second and seven rollout throwback play, I think it's just atrocious. Granted, not blocked well, but just a dumb idea in the first place. But when I, when I think about, okay, what Feetner could do better, I, I, what do you even call with this offense at this point when they can't even get a snap executed right, uh, when they can't even you know get a, a quarterback center exchange away correctly without the center stepping on Rudolph and causing him to go down? I mean, I don't even know what you do as an OC. I mean, so, so the spot Feetner's in, I mean, would a better OC have more production? Sure, but how much better really could it be with this offense is struggling to do basic things. Yeah, and 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 I know the casual fan will say fire him, you know, mm. but I I I, uh, I think it goes a little bit deeper behind that. That's why I can't get on the whole fire him right now because once again, uh, look at the other side of the ball. You have talent there, you have pedigree. Look look what happens. You are so dependent on the players in the National Football League, uh, where just a coordinator is not going to make a make all that much of a difference based on the group of players that you have out there right now. You know, uh, you still yeah, have I mean, got to execute this thing, you know, uh, top, top to bottom. If you have a quarterback that's not willing to throw towards the middle of the field, if you have guys like, uh, I keep going back to that damn playoff game, the uh, AFC championship game a couple years ago against the Patriots, where I think we you know, <clears throat> had a little bit of optimism about, Okay, maybe they can get the Patriots this time. And then then you get two or three years removed from it, and you look at Kobe Hamilton and uh, some of the guys that were on the field for that game, you know, and you think to yourself, well, Christ, no wonder they lost it, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, because you get in a moment, you, 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 you tend to know more about your own than the other own, you know what I'm saying? And sure. I, I think this is a situation here. Uh, Deion Kane, let's, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> Deion Kane isn't here, you know, if, if a few few things don't happen. Uh, Kareth White, still, you know, these guys are still trying to learn the offense, let alone run it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, your tight ends, I don't know what you think about Vanette at this point either. I mean, I think we kind of had that conversation a couple of shows ago uh, as well, too. McDonald and Vanette, what are those two guys? Neither one of them are going to be closely even mentioned. You put both of them together and you don't even have half of uh, 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 George Kittle, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of thing. So, I mean, you got below, to me now, you have below average tight ends. You have a line that's starting to show their age. Uh, look at the quarterback position. You have you've missed Juju for how many games? Yeah, uh, basically what five six games. Uh, you lost Connor for how many games? And he's he hasn't even been right. He hasn't been right since he uh, that last carry in Miami. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even the games he's played, Cleveland yesterday, he's bowed out. You know, early. And and bless Jalen Samuel's heart, but <laughs> he, he's not an every down running back. Mm-hmm. And really what it comes to Feetner for me is that do you want to make an offensive coordinator change with Ben in essentially the last two years of his career? No, that's why you promoted 
feet in her in the first place. That's why you you know moved on from Haley and stayed in house with the guy that Ben's liked and the guy that that functioned well with him last year. So you know Ben and, and, and Feetner are kind of tied at the hip. You're not going to make a change, and that's what it comes down to. If it, if Ben wasn't coming back, if you if Ben was 30 years old, you know, then maybe, yeah, you're going to make a change. But as long as Ben's here and, uh, you know, Feetner is kind of his guy, you know, rightly or wrongly, I think Feetner's going to be back. You know, and that's some of the things, you know, why even, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we'll, 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 as we get into the off season, we, we go back through these, through these game tapes 10 more times each. You know, we're going to find deficiencies and things. They, is Randy Feetner a top 10 offensive coordinator in the league? Absolutely no. not. You know? No. Absolutely not. You know, and I don't think anybody's pretending uh, that's the case either. But uh, if you you're just hollering into the you're just you know you're just screaming at the cloud right now at this point if you're hollering for him to get fired. Yeah, I mean, like, because I mean, like you you stated, the last two years of Ben's career, do you think Ben wants to wants to go through that? Uh, uh, and if your quarterback ain't happy, ain't nobody. If your franchise quarterback ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Look at what mm-hmm. look at Aaron Rodgers. You know, right. it's not just about him being happy, but it's going to take a year just to kind of feel each other out and figure out what works best for Ben with the new OC and vice versa. So then it basically gives you only 2021 to try to win this whole thing. And I just you want to maximize this window as much as possible. And I, and I think changing OC is going to hurt those chances. Right. And because and, and, his and, offense was successful last year. Granted, you had AB and right. obviously it's more talent, but obviously this offense has produced last year with Ben feet and working together. And so I think you just bring them back and, and hope for a similar result. Yeah, you need to coach good players, though. You do, yeah. I mean, again, I think with this quarterback situation, it's such a mess. I don't know how much better. I think uh, I think a better OC would would obviously make this offense better, but how much, I, I don't know. Uh, not a whole lot, I don't think at this point. You've got to have some level of consistent and acceptable quarterback play, regardless of how good your defense is. Now, what's that? What's that acceptable? Uh, uh, consistent level. You know, if you want to put a stat on it, you know, a 5.0 adjusted net yards per passing attempt number would be nice, you know, mm-hmm. or, or slightly above that. Because uh, w- anything higher than what your defense is, and your defense is damn good. So if your defense is like 4.8, 4.7, give me something around the 5 or 5.2 range that I can live with. Well, you're not going to get that when you're throwing these kind of uh, when you're not throwing touchdowns and when you're throwing interceptions and when you're getting sacked, you just you're not going to get that. And they just have not. Yeah, there was a couple of games that 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 Devlin Hodge just posted a nice number in that, but but a couple of games just ain't going to do it. You got to have some consistency from that position and some level of success, especially when you're in the other other team's territory there, and they're just not getting it. And the defense just can't do it all all the time and how many times earlier in the season have we talk about what's going to happen if this team doesn't get the multiple turnovers or doesn't score themselves on defense what's going to happen and unfortunately we've seen some games like that now Mm -hmm. agreed well said dave and also for those scoring at home i just hit steelers depot bingo with adjusted net yards per attempt we got a george kittle a bless his heart so uh, prizes uh, to all the winners uh, (laughs) turning their cards We'll let you know what, what you want. Uh, no, I agree. Well said. When your offense is, is this poor, I mean, really, what can you do at this point? This offense is as bad as it's been. They have thrown more interceptions. What, than what, what, what did you like about the offense yesterday? Uh, <laughs> what was the joke you had on Twitter about the old Tampa Bay Buccaneers coach? Uh, the execution <laughs> John, of the offense. John McKay. Yeah, I'm all for it. I'm all what, for the execution of their offense. Alex, what did you think about your execution of the offense? I'm in favor of it. I'm, I'm in favor for it. Yeah. Uh, now, what did I like? I mean, you know, Deontay Johnson again playing, uh, playing through the end here. And again, he talked about hitting the rookie wall, but I think you know his route running, um, being more detail oriented, providing some splash in the punt return game it was nice. Kareth White showing some juice. Connor again ran well whenever he was in there. I think Connor was was playing poorly uh, before he got hurt, but that's been the story. Unfortunately, the caveat with him uh, basically throughout his entire career, unfortunately. So not a whole lot of positives there. Yeah, I think it's Deontay Johnson, and it kind of ends there. Here's a quick note about that. Believe it or not, he had eight receptions in that game yesterday. Thank God he did. (laughs) Uh, He needs seven, just seven more in the finale uh, to set a new rookie uh, reception record. 
Where did that come uh, from? Uh, that, yeah. that, that kind of crept up on us there, didn't it? And who uh, has the, the current record? Uh, uh, Troy Edwards, 1999. Wow. Uh, uh, how old were you in 1999? Six. Wow. Uh, makes but me. Th- I, I, my my six-year-old, my play receiver for the Steelers right now. Uh, I it also I, this is an early preview of stats of the weird. Um, if well, assuming Deontay Johnson has the most receptions for, uh, on the team this year, he'll be the first Steelers rookie to lead the team in receptions outright since Ron Shanklin and Dave Smith, I believe, in 1970. So Edwards had 61 that year, but he was tied with Heinz Ward. So uh, the outright lead will be the first time since uh, basically since the merger. Wow. So not only not only set a new franchise reception record for a rookie, but mm-hmm. lead lead the team in it as well too. That's uh, that that lets you know who who would have <laughs> no way no way <laughs> nope. you would have believed me. And if I would have told you if I would have told if I would have given you just the receiver numbers at the beginning of the year where they're at right now, you would told you would probably tell me there's no way this team is competing for a wild card spot in seven in week seventeen. Right. Right. So sometimes, you know, we get so caught up at looking at our own and and, and trying to look past some of the warts. We kind of I still think it's a hell of a job that they've done this year overall, especially the defense. But unfortunately, now we're going to be looking back at this uh, this this season saying, man, if only been if only if only they would have had been, you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess when Ben went down and you saw some of the Rudolph struggles, you kind of just thought, okay, maybe eight and eight's a best case scenario, which is maybe what ends up happening. I mean, maybe they go nine and seven, obviously, but uh, the route that they took to go to eight and eight potentially is is disappointing because you were eight and five and you were right there in this thing, you just had to win a couple of these games and, and you were in. So if they, you know, had they been, you know, a six and whatever team and then clawed their way back to eight and eight, it would have felt good. But obviously, going from eight and five and dropping like this is is similar to last year where you collapsed. Uh, makes eight and eight uh, a tough pill to swallow. Uh, especially now, when you look back at the last two games, look at the 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 the, the points scored by the opposition. You know, mm-hmm. should have won. Should have won. You know, those uh, y- y- your defense is 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 doing everything it's supposed to do. You know, uh, for the most part. I mean, obviously shutouts would be nice, uh, but uh, uh, you know, other than, this is National Football League now. If you hold, if you hold the team to 17, 16 points or below, you you've really done your job, and you should win a lot of these games, even with just mediocre, mediocre quarterback play. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's just killing them. And Mike Tomlin said as much during his press conference. You know, you can't turn the football over uh, like that. And the fact that they turned the football over once again as many times as they did. And yet, still had another game that they could have won late. Uh, just let you know how bad it is, you know, or, yeah, or how how good it is defensively and how bad it is offensively. That's all you needed from this offense was mediocre quarterback play and even just a below average offense in, in general. And you probably win these these past two games. And you did. You haven't gotten even that level uh, as low as the bar is. And so that's why you're needing help for the playoffs. So before we talk about the defense a little more in depth, Dave, I want to t- break here just to talk about the playoff scenarios for week 17 because obviously this team is no longer control their own destiny but there still is a pretty clear path to the playoffs it involves the the Steelers having to beat the Ravens this weekend that's a must and then Houston beating Tennessee so there's your scenario maybe you're most likely there's another scenario right where it takes a lot let's assume that doesn't happen um but that's your that's your clearest path to getting into the wild card yeah yeah, and and people say, well, why did the Steelers, uh, uh, both uh, them and Tennessee, lost uh, this week? How did they fall from the sixth to the seventh spot? Well, it's because of the one played a conference game and the other played out of conference. Uh, uh, in, in, you know, in that situation, so that's why uh, you, uh, you you switch spots, so to speak, with with Tennessee. Now you get into this last you, in this last week. You're right. Uh, they. The, the best way for them to make the playoffs or the most reasonable path would be for them to beat the Baltimore Ravens. And, look, you're going to play a Baltimore. I, maybe this will be a more even game now. <laughs> but mm-hmm. they but they, uh, they they play a Baltimore Ravens team that that has nothing to play for. And I don't know why these people or why several people are saying, well, oh, no, they're not going to rest these guys because they want to keep a division rival out of the playoffs. You think the Ravens give one? You, you know what? You know what about whether or not the Steelers make the playoffs at this point? I don't. Yeah, I think the report is they're already 
going to bench at least Lamar and probably one or two other key starters. And Ingram uh, 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 had a strain of something or whatnot. Calf. Yeah, calf. Uh, uh, calf injury. He's not going to play. Now, look, you, there's only you have, your, your inactive list is only <laughs> only seven guys, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And even you know, even if you want to try to rest a few other guys, you're still going to have to play several of these guys. Right. You know. Uh, now you, but but you're gonna you well, you're obviously gonna pick you know your best players there and try to keep them off the field and obviously the quarterback position when it comes to the Ravens is one of those key uh, uh, obvious key positions so because them not playing Lamar Jackson because them not playing Mark Ingram you're going to have a shot in this game you know uh, overall but anyway uh, you still got to win the game uh, that's your best path there and then on top of the bad thing they've I guess it's a perfect time to say that the, that game's been flexed to the afternoon they also mm-hmm. flex the uh, the Titans in Tennessee game uh, now here's the thing with that uh, yeah, with them flexing that game uh, the Titans game and the Steelers game they left the Chiefs game against the Chargers uh, early in the early in the day there. So here, here's a scenario that could could develop there, and I don't want to hear that's not fair because the, the because long story short, Steelers are playing a team that's not going to be interested either. Uh, but you could run into a situation that if the Chargers win that game, I mean, if the Chiefs beat the Chargers in that early game, week 17, well, the, the Texans are locked into the number four. Four, four spot at that point. So why in God's green earth would they, would you know, I, I'm not playing Deshaun Watson, mm-hmm. you know, at that point. And people are also trying to go back to, to and really shame on John McClain from the Houston Chronicle, who does great work. I really think he, the way he quote tw- or put this out on Twitter uh, has got people thinking the wrong thing there, uh, saying that Bill O'Brien said he would play his starters uh, against Tennessee, he did. I, you know me. I got to go find the root of the quote, and I, and I did. And I listened to that whole press conference of his, and Bill O'Brien was asked essentially, "Look, if you have a chance for the number three seed, you know, uh, you know, what what are you going to do with your players?" He and and all Bill O'Brien said, "Look, we we're going to play to win the game." All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of, kind of going back to uh, kind of a Herm Edwards kind of situation right. there. It, it, all it means is we're going to try to win the game. It doesn't say, it doesn't mean anything about who he didn't answer who he's going to play or who he's not going to play. And once again, I, let me ask you: if if you got into kick near kickoff of that time of that game and you look up at that scoreboard and Kansas City's beating the living snot out of the Chargers, what are you doing against Tennessee? Not playing Deshaun Watson, that's for sure. And I'm getting uh, Hopkins off the field too. Mm-hmm. Yep. B- because if they, if they, if you don't have those two guys with with that team, you can forget about it. You know. Uh. So that you you know, already you're 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 likely. Boy, you better hope to hell that uh, everybody ought to break out the Philip Rivers jerseys this this week because. Uh, but he, let me ask you this too. Does a number three seed mean all that much to you if you're if you're Houston? Yeah, I'd have to look at it. I, I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly how you prepare. How do you divvy up quarterback reps in the week if you have a contingency plan based on what the Chiefs are doing? I'm not sure what Houston's approach is going to be. Um, but if it was me personally, I wouldn't be playing you know my key guys if I was Houston. It's not hey, worth it. Period. Right. <laughs> right, period. Yeah, period. Because it's not even worth it to make that risk to move up potentially a seed when you kind of have a pretty good feeling that Chiefs are likely to beat the Chargers. Right. And, uh, uh, I mean, e- 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 even if you look at the scoreboard and they're getting blown out, I mean, okay, what's the, what's the, are you going to look that far ahead down the line of who you might play to make a decision or whether or not you might make a play? I, I, I just, I'm not convinced that, uh, that, that they should take the game serious at all, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. Yeah, I mean, I guess the bottom line is we don't know exactly how Houston's going to approach this thing. They're obviously going to get some information before their game about where their seating is. And uh, Pittsburgh and, 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 and Houston, the Tennessee game, are both been flex at 425. So Steelers fans will have to wait a little bit longer to exactly know their playoff fate if they have any. All right, so what's the other scenario? Obviously, if Tennessee wins, it does not matter. Uh yeah. uh Tennessee's it, in with a win, right? Right. Tennessee is, is, is in with a win. Now— what happens if the Steelers and Tennessee both lose? Well, you need the Colts to beat the Jaguars, 
and you need technically the Raiders to do the opposite of what they did this week, which is win. So you're going to need the Raiders to lose to the uh, Denver Broncos. Uh, if you got those things to happen, all those, in other words, if Tennessee lost, if the Colts win, and if the Raiders lose, you're in. Now, the Raiders, you can get those things to happen and the Raiders win, then you get into the strength of victory and all. And you're going to need, you would need, part of that I think includes Miami beating New England. Uh, and I think uh, the Vikings beating the Bears or so a lot, a lot of other things got to happen. I think you got to. I think Kevin Colbert has to personally go out and catch uh, Man, Man Bear Pig is mm-hmm. part part of that scenario on top of it. But uh, look, it, it doesn't look positive right now. I, I'll tell you that. I go. I went from uh, going into the Baltimore, going into the game against the Bills, thinking. Yeah, I think this team's going to make the playoffs to right now. I'm not so sure this team's going to make the playoffs. Yeah, obviously odds are, are against them right now. Okay, Dave, so that's your playoff scenario. To go to the defense, I think it's more of the same. I mean, the, the opening possession was poor. Beyond that, they played well. They created enough splash. I will say the pass rush hasn't been consistent enough. Only three sacks the last two weeks. Hoping for more out of the you know defense that has the most sacks in football. But uh, I mean, it's hard to blame them because, again, they're keeping the score down uh, for most situations, for most offenses. That's enough to win these games. Yeah, I mean, T.J. Watt doing what he can do and had, had another seem, seemingly great game uh, uh, in there. Uh, overall, the pass rush probably wasn't as good as what you'd maybe had hoped for in that game, right? Right. Uh, I, and what, did, what, did, what did they do special? Uh, it didn't look like, I mean, they, they had a little bit of chipping going on, but I didn't think it was anything, you know, like you look at what the Bills did uh, uh, to, to combat that. I just think the tackles played better. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's any sort of wearing down from this front four for, throughout the season because they're playing a high volume of snaps. Dupree, 90%. Hayworth playing a ton of time. Hargrave playing a lot more time, obviously, with two it out. I, I don't know for sure, obviously. I have to go back and check the tape for starters, but I wonder if there's just kind of these guys are getting a little – beaten down because of the volume of snaps they've had to play over the course of the season. A couple of blown coverages, uh, especially on the Wesco play. It looked like initially, and I think there was a play kind of similar to it early in the game where, I don't know, Hilton told Bush to go with, anyway, it looks like this one might be on Bush for for, for not following the tight end out, uh, mm-hmm. uh, out, out on that, but I'll get a better, a little bit better idea uh, once the all 22 comes out there, but it, l- it kind of looks like the rookie made a mistake in that situation. Yeah, would be the most likely and easiest explanation. We'll have to go back and check the all 22, but yeah, uh, either way you get a tight end in Wesco 32 yards sets up a field goal for the Jets. That was obviously a, a, a pretty big play. Yeah. Uh, what other, what other, what other blown coverages or anything do we have to talk about? I mean, uh, overall in that one, there wasn't, you know, wasn't too terribly bad once again, but you know, look in, in a close game like that, when you need points, one big play can make a difference. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. No, I think uh, status quo for the defense, um, run defense tighten up after kind of a sluggish start. Uh, they, they kind of laid off some of the blitzing packages. They tried early when Donald was countering it. Well, the jets came out with a good game plan and bottom line is you allowed 16 points to, to an offense that, you know, was decent. I mean, you know, I think that's about what you would expect to, facing this Jets group that's been a better offense lately than it was, say, at the start of the year when they had all the quarterback woes. Uh, you're keeping the score down. You're letting your offense be in it. Uh, your offense just just can't produce. I mean, it's really, again, they've allowed 17 or fewer points in five straight games. I mean, that's tough to do at this level in the NFL, and the offense simply just can't hold up their end of the bargain. They only gave up three explosive plays in this game. One of them was the uh, pass to Wesco. Uh, one of them was the uh, touchdown pass to Robbie Anderson. And the other one uh, was a fourth quarter uh, pass to uh, Crowder uh, over on the uh, on short left side there. That uh, try, I'm trying to re- replay that one. Didn't they end up getting a field goal on that drive? I don't remember, to be honest with but, you. But I think all three of these explosive plays of theirs ended up in some points of some some fashion. Uh, the Steelers only had three explosive plays on offense. Uh, one of them was the, uh, obviously the touchdown pass to Deontay Johnson. Uh, one of them was that screen short left to uh, Jalen Samuels that he got 27 yards on. And technically the other one wasn't an explosive play. It was the uh, short pass over to the right for, for uh, to, uh, to James Washington 
that uh, the horse collar was. I thought he tore up his knee initially mm-hmm. yeah. when when, uh, when he went down there. Thank God he didn't. I think it was more of an ankle that he had to get taped up. A return from that, but uh, technically only two offense, two two explosive plays for the Steelers offensively. And you know how many? What did we talk about earlier earlier in uh, the season about how explosive plays play a big role in touchdown drives, and it's just not getting enough of them. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's bad when you have as many explosive plays as you do turnovers. That jogs my memory of the stat I had over the last two weeks. The Steelers have a combined eight third down conversions. And they have seven turnovers. So not good when your turnovers and third down conversions are basically matching. Yeah, absolutely. And then, boy, there's just have. when's the last time they've had five explosive plays in a game? I don't know. Uh, too long, I'm, I'm sure, whatever the, the, the date is. All right, Dave, special teams, boss from 49. He's been money this year. Probably one of the best bounce back years ever from a kicker who had the type of year that he had last season. Barry, I thought junior varsity, again, not good enough. Another guy having a really poor multi-game stretch. Kick return game, not much. A little bit of something in the punt return game, uh, and then some penalties as well that were that were frustrating. Yeah, boy, Johnson's got some burst back there, uh, but unfortunately, one of those I think was on Dangerfield uh, mm-hmm. call, call back there. Uh, you know, yeah, not enough really to spend any time on talking about. Yeah, yeah, the Snell encroachment. They gave the Jets a new set of downs. Oh yeah, that that's fun. I don't, yeah, I posted the uh, side-by-side of the candidate call last week, getting called for false start for putting his head up. He gets called for false start. Jets long snapper does the same thing this week. Benny Snell's called for neutral zone infraction. I, I'm not trying to complain about it. Ultimately, it didn't affect the game. Steelers forced the punt three plays later. I'm not trying to blame the refs for the loss here. Clearly, this loss is on the Steelers and, and, and nobody else, but I don't understand the internal logic of the NFL officiating, and I doubt I ever will. Yeah, either make the knot, make it where a long snapper can't do it, or, or or what? You know, just so inconsistent, you know. Yep. Okay, Dave, anything else from this game? I mean, I think it's pretty cut and dry. The offense just continues to be abysmal, and that's unlikely to change against the Ravens. Even if they bench some of their key guys, they're only going to be able to bench so many players. Like you said, with the whole got to address 46, uh, and you just wait till next year and you know, let Ben come back and hope things get a whole lot better, and they should. Yeah, I mean, and and look, I mean, outside chance they uh, they got an outside chance to make the playoffs, but if they do make the playoffs, once again, uh, you know, offense offense is not doing them doing enough. While you even if you won one playoff game, which I think Mike Tomlin would need to do to win Coach of the Year, uh, look, Coach of the Year, you're not going to hear a lot of Coach of the Year talk <laughs> right right now. The last two games, right? Yeah. Well, I've gotten it just in, in sarcasm, in jest. Uh, that's as close as I've had to uh, go to the year talks. Right. I mean, uh, uh, up up until then, yeah. Uh, but the last two weeks, no. And at this point, and I've, I've kind of said this all along, for him to, to, to actually win the coach of the year, they would have to get into the playoffs and win at least one game. And that just seems like so many rest stops down the road. Uh, from from where we are at this point, it's amazing how you break this kind of thing into kind of the roller coaster uh, ride that that we've been, been on mm-hmm. <laughs> in this thing. You know, you lose, you you lose, you get your ass kicked by the Patriots to start with. You go in and 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 you know Ben goes down against the Seahawks, and you know then you think it all oh, gloom, despair, and agony on me, and then. You know, you win a couple of games there. You come out of the, you know, it's been, it really has been a roller coaster ride. So there, there was one point, especially a couple of weeks ago, where I thought, hey, this team might, you know, probably going to get in the playoffs, expecting them to, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. and, and now in a matter of two weeks' time, uh, I, I don't think this team, it's amazing that this team's gotten this far. <laughs> but based on the way things are going, maybe they end up in the playoffs because it's just been this back and forth, you know, expect the unexpected kind of thing. So who knows? Maybe we're talking playoffs next week. A- anything can happen at this point. But uh, mm-hmm. one thing's for sure, they don't control, they don't 100% control what happens. All right. Again, like last year, have to be scoreboard watching in week 17, never the place you want to be in. All right, Dave, uh, let's talk about our friends over at my bookie. We'll get to some of your emails and then close out the show. All right. Uh, are you the type of fan that knows football so well that you could choose any game and call it? Well, my bookie is the place for you because you they let you turn all of your sports knowledge into cash in your wallet. Between football season, NBA, boy, you got to uh, uh, you know, watch a couple of them. Who, who's your NBA team? Portland, isn't it? 
No, Phoenix. Phoenix. They, Phoenix. they started well, and now they're bad again. So uh, okay. all is right with the world. Are they playing on Christmas or no? I'm not sure. I don't believe so. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, you know, NBA usually has a huge lineup on, uh, on, on, mm-hmm. on on Christmas Day there. So between football season, NBA, and the start of college basketball season, it's time to get off the sideline and get in on the action with my bookie. If you're the kind of guy or girl who likes to bet a little uh, and win a lot, try a parlay. For instance, if you like a couple of big favorites this week, parlays are perfect because they let you bet multiple games together for a much bigger payout. Look, you can mix some of these sports together too on some of these some of these parlays if you like that's the best thing about it if you got the knowledge about it if you're pretty sure on a couple of these games regardless of what sport they are you can package them together into a nice uh three or five or however many team parlay uh, uh that you like there so if you're going to bet this season do the smart thing and go to mybookie.ag because no one gives you more ways to win tired of watching the games from the couch with nothing to gain my bookie wants to get your mind off everything else and back on the game if you join right now my book you will match your deposit halfway all the way up to one thousand dollars that's right that means if you put uh, if you deposit two thousand dollars you get an extra thousand dollars in free money to play with to take advantage of this offer go to mybookie.ag and use promo code terrible that's promo code terrible to activate the offer once again that's promo code terrible to take advantage of my bookie's generous sign up offer visit mybookie.ag today you play you win you get paid and maybe soon there'll be a bet posted on my bookie about Marshawn Lynch. According to Ian Rappaport, Marshawn Lynch and the Seahawks are open to a reunion. So Beast Mode might be coming back to, to the 12th man. Boy, they lost, uh, they've lost uh, Penny. They lost, mm-hmm. didn't they lose Carson? Carson? Yep. And one of them didn't, wasn't another running back hurt yesterday or no? I'm not sure, but those are the top two guys, yeah. so you might see Marshawn Lynch back in football, which is which would be hilarious, and I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, uh, where, where are we at now? Uh, some reader emails, oh, which I'm sure Christ. are just <laughs> cheery and optimistic. Yeah, do I have to? Uh, let's see here. All right. Uh, here we go. This is from Andrew Gallus. Uh, screwed by the NFL. Houston, nothing to play for. Hey, guys, love what you do. The NFL moved our game in Houston, Tennessee to 4 o'clock slot. That's great. Uh, but Houston will have nothing to play for if Kansas City wins their 1 p.m. game. Shouldn't the NFL move that game to 4 also? Uh, it makes no sense that they leave it as is. I'm outraged along with the rest of the core members of, uh, of our Steelers trip. Uh, how can this happen? Thanks, guys. Uh, and it's Andy Mott, uh, 15. Let's see. Uh, just a net yards for passing attempt and run success rate diehard. All right. Andrew, a- Andrew's a fan of, mm-hmm. uh, of my stats there. Andy, we just kind of talked about, uh, this, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you want to wrap your mind around the whole, you know, they'd probably been better off leaving all the games where they were to start with. Right. Mm-hmm. Because they were all one o'clock games, weren't they? Right. I mean, Pittsburgh was, I think. Yeah, Houston. Yeah, yeah. They were all one o'clock games. That yeah, would have been smart, smart. Play. And then look, it's not like you can put all of them on TV anyway, you know. So, uh, what's what's the plus of moving m- moving them around? You know, just to to delay the drama, I guess. I don't know. I guess, uh, but, but but just to be to be addressed, one thing he said. Let's be clear: uh, the NFL did not screw the Steelers. The Steelers have screwed themselves by by not controlling their own destiny. If they beat the Jets, they won't have to worry about games being flexed and scoreboard watching all that stuff. Steelers are sure have no one to blame but themselves for for the scenario. I guess they screwed the fan uh, uh, aspect. Uh, I understand. And, I, no, I get what he's saying, but yeah, I just wanna, I'm making a, a oh, yeah, point. Yeah. But none, not nonetheless, I wanted to at least point that out. Steelers screwing themselves here. And look, if the NFL truly wanted to make these games as meaningful as possible, you know, maybe maybe they leave the, I don't know, maybe they leave the Steelers one alone, uh, and then move the other two, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, e- e- either they should have moved all of them, or or they should have left all of them the same. Uh, I, I I get I get what he's what he's mad about, but overall, once again, like you said, <laughs> they shouldn't be in this position anyway. Mm-hmm. No, I get I get the question. Uh, I understand. I'm with you. Either move them all or don't move any of them. But uh, Steelers have no one to blame but themselves, and they got to beat Baltimore too, which will be no easy task even with their backups in. 
Okay, uh, Jay Bobardi's uh, just getting in uh, this morning. He says, uh, was there any discernible strategy to their running back rotation? It just seems like they were dead set on swapping them randomly. White seemed like the most effective runner on the day after Connor, but they consistently pulled him after solid runs. How is there? How is any back supposed to get in a rhythm when they can't get more than a couple consecutive carries? How is the line supposed to uh, cohere? When there's someone different running behind every snap uh, about Mason, you guys hit the nail on the head. He is so much better off the bench than he's been as a starter. Look, I told you a couple weeks ago we are not done seeing Mason Rudolph. Uh, you know, the bad thing about it is I wish we could have seen a little bit more at the end of that game uh, mm-hmm. of him. About the whole running back rotation thing, uh, uh, Barbati, uh, look uh, – you know, you got different skill sets with these guys. I, you know, once Connor went out, you're back to kind of the hodgepodge. But I will say this, that kind of that three-headed, uh, or really four-headed, I guess, uh, however you want to look at it, got the job done there for the, for the three games that, that Connor was out for. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's tough trying to juggle it all. I don't know what's going into their mindset. Usually it's a positional coach to handle this rotation, so that'd be Eddie Faulkner, first year in the job. Maybe he's making some mistakes and probably some things he would want to change. He, he, he's a year. guy that might not be back next year. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I guess Snell's developed okay. Uh, there's been a lot of injuries. I, who knows? It's tough to, to evaluate those guys. I, I don't have a clean answer for you. Uh, I wish I did. I'm sure they you know would like to do some things over themselves. Uh, let's see. Flexing from Chris in Connecticut writes in, if the Ravens have nothing to play for, why should the NFL flex the Chiefs to 4 p.m.? Well, a lot of people are upset about this flexing uh, mm-hmm. to make uh, make sure the Texans have, quote unquote, have something to play for. Sure would help the Steelers, but uh, is it fair to the Titans? Of course, I want the Steelers to have every advantage, but we have to look at this objectively. Yeah, you know, the objectively way to look at this is, I think they should have left the thing alone. <laughs> but if not, I think you got to look at it as well. The Steelers are already getting a team that's not interested, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I get the flex thing, but really, I'm not thinking about it too much. I'm just more frustrated about the Steelers putting themselves in this situation in the first place. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a negative one about me from, uh, Jeff Perry writes in Dave, please stop screaming into the microphone on your podcast. For whatever reason, the volume of your voice goes from low to very high and hurts my ears. Uh, you ought to hear what my wife says about me. Uh, the <laughs> podcasts are good, but, uh, could be much shorter and still get the same point. This team is terrible. And if you're going to talk about anything, spend time on the salary cap and scenarios of keeping and releasing players next season and beyond James Conner and Juju are two guys. You should at least discuss scenarios where they don't get signed. Uh, Jeff, let me, uh, let me ask you this. We got, you know how long we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, people are going to get tired of us talking about scenarios with, with James Conner and Juju. We can't just talk about that, uh, right now. Uh, you know, and that, that only, we got to talk about the game and, and, you know, what happens the rest of this year. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about salary cap. Uh, let's see. And you two guys should at least discuss scenarios where they don't don't get signed. Uh, also, what what options are out there for quarterback? What is the likely scenario to draft a replacement for Ben this year or next? Please do not spend four hours and two days breaking down the Jets game and talking about the upcoming Ravens game. Uh, if you do make it uh, about the players and not coaches or play con, players make plays. Jeff, you're probably just not going to want to listen until the off season, pal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about players and coaches. We're going to talk about the upcoming upcoming opponent. Um... I don't know what to tell you, my man. Yeah, maybe just take the rest of the season off, uh, uh, Jeff. Which may only be another week. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry to disappoint you, and I'll try, I'll try not to yell. Uh, we Probably, uh, Jeff, uh, you and us, we need a break from each other, it sounds like. So uh, thanks thanks for listening uh, up until this point. Uh, Jonathan uh, writes in, uh, the difference in talent, I guess I, I just told, uh, told him to F off, didn't I? Well, I don't know if he was going to listen again anyway, yeah, but uh, so. I mean, hopefully, Jeff, you circle back for the off season. All right, uh, Jonathan writes in, the difference in talent seems really obvious now between Duck and Mason. However, if Mason isn't healthy enough to go, f- funny how we're getting this shift now, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we went from 
Oh man, Mason's absolutely horrible to now to Duck the Savior to now man Mason the talent difference between Mason and Duck is is mm-hmm. obvious. And, and that's uh, why I've always said we have to evaluate these quarterbacks they, they after did, the season. They didn't believe us, did they? No, because these things change week to week so much, and if you try to make these concrete statements after just a couple games, you're probably going to end up being re- changing your tune, which I think people have uh, you know, when you get into it a month later. So that's why you just try to look at the season in totality, see how the whole thing plays out, then you evaluate after the year. Do you, you know how much flack I've caught, and I guess you to some degree on this, by, by not wanting to say this guy isn't the guy or this guy is the guy? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm sure, yeah. Because, look, you, you can't – I don't think you – you got to have a large selection of games and put these quarterbacks in different situations and see how they respond to certain things and certain defenses and all. And you're just not going to get that out of three or four games, man. Uh, now we look like the uh, the geniuses and we didn't even do nothing, you know? Well, uh, I'm not. I'm, 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 par- I'm paraphrasing. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just saying that, that we were smart not to draw any hard conclusions is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Anyway, I'm sorry I, I interrupted. But what was the, uh... Uh, however, if Mason isn't healthy enough, could we see Paxton Lynch start on Sunday? Uh, I, I unless you want to take a hard look at Paxton, I mean that that uh, I don't think it's going to change the outcome of anything. No, I think you just go with Duck, uh, learn some more about him, and I don't know. He's gotten the guys at least gotten the in in helmet perspective this year. So I, I'm probably rolling with Duck, assuming Rudolph can't play. I know it's not going to be a popular answer, but there are no good answers here. And once again, you put Duck in the game. with the, Look, if Rudolph can't play, he can't play. Then you dress Paxton. I think that's obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you go into the game once again, thinking that the, this is a must-win game. And if your quarterback can't, can't, take care, uh, take, t- can't take care of the football, then you make a change, right? Yeah, probably. I mean, it's I don't, I don't know. Again, there's no good answers here. I think you go with Duck and you go with a plan to try to succeed and you adjust from there. Right. I I think that's what that's what you do as well. Uh, let's see here. Moving on from Jonathan. Uh, Austin writes in, first year listener, and I'm so happy that I found you guys. I really appreciate all the work and research that goes in. Can't imagine a workload. Uh, super disappointed in this year's performance down the stretch. We had playoffs at our fingertips. Uh, offense is trying to give away. I think opposing teams' ability to stop the run is really exposing Duck and Mason for who they are. A UDFA and a backup still love them. Ha ha. I don't expect us to do much in the playoffs if, if we even make it. A few notes. Man, it would be nice to have a tight end who has speed and can, can be a vertical threat. Would you you guys consider taking one with our second pick uh, if the talent is there? Absolutely, I'd be interested in it. Uh, he says, I'm disappointed with Vance, uh, with Vanette and McDonald. We need to address the offensive line in the draft. These guys are getting old, getting hurt. Their performance is uh, deteriorating almost every week, it feels like. Uh, he's praying that Ben can come back with another 5K yard season. Uh, worried about Juju. Can't make big plays in big moments. Health, health is a concern. Uh, another bullet point he has here is Connor can't stay healthy. Thanks again. You guys are the best. Austin. Uh, look, yeah, I think he hit on a lot of key things there, uh, Austin, that, 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 that we talked about. I wouldn't put a five, I wouldn't put a number on Ben's season. Uh, I, I really think that Ben's 5K season was a result of the damn team starting at their own 25 yard line or less uh, most of that, that season there. But I mean, obviously, Ben coming back would, would, would do wonders uh, for this. And I, I don't think if he hit on anything else there, that was, that was earth shattering, right? No, uh, fair points across the board. Uh, Bryce writes in worst loss of the season. Uh, this is definitely the worst uh, worst loss of the season. Some thoughts. Uh, once again, Greg Williams, coach defense, uh, gives the Steelers fits. It's one thing, struggles because of injuries and new players. Quite another to be historically bad in so many other areas of the offense. Uh, when something is historically bad, that points to coaching. You know, I, I, historically bad, I, what, in facing Greg Williams? I mean, I, I, here's what they didn't do. They didn't pick up, you know, for two weeks in a row, they did a bad job of picking up uh, picking up blitzes. Mm-hmm. And that part of that is on coaching. Not all of it, but part of it. Right. Uh, I don't know where to historically, uh, unless you're talking about historically playing uh, Greg Williams. I don't know what he's what he's talking about there. I, 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 maybe just the idea of how bad the offense has been in general. I don't know exactly how to – Put that in perspective historically, but it's it's been really bad. I mean, there's no question about that. Yeah, it's been bad this year. I mean, 
with without out Ben obviously uh, please uh, please miss me with this idea people have that the Steers will have it easier if the Ravens sit some starters as bad as the Steers offense is they will struggle to move the ball and score uh, on anyone that they play I think in order for them to win next Sunday they they need Juju to absolutely go off work in the middle middle of the field 50 50 ball screens reverses anything to get him the ball uh, number three Alex I know you said absolutely no quarterbacks in the second round of next year's draft and I 95% agree, except for that 5% that leaves open for Jalen Hurts. If he were to somehow fall to us in a second, I would take him all day and 10 times on Sunday. Uh, I like Jalen Hurts, at least off the field. Uh, the demeanor that he has is awesome. He's had a really successful season and transferring and overcoming all that. But, I mean, I, I still stand by the you need to build around Ben, not find his replacement in this draft. You are so close to trying to – be able to get over this hump. Obviously, Ben coming back will be huge, instrumental, monumental for this this offense. Uh, my focus is on building this team around him and not saying, you know, this time next year, man, if we just had this other receiver or this other tight end or we would have addressed the whole left by Hargrave and or Dupree better in the second round, you know, maybe, maybe we have a better shot at this thing. So I just want to have all this focus being on because you're not going to win without Ben. I mean, that's the bottom line. Ben goes down again. You're just kind of screwed. Um, so let's focus on building up this up this roster as much as possible with number seven as your quarterback. And you better right now. We're and, and let let's assume maybe they get Dupree can get Dupree back. All right, mm-hmm. some way, somehow, and that's dangerous for us to do right now. Assume that's going to happen. But let's say that does happen. You, you, you're probably going to, to be able to even get to that point, you're going to have to make some moves on offense that we talk about. McDonald, uh, Foster, you know, uh, on and on. You, you're going to need to fill in some of these holes with early draft pick, I, I, I think. A tight end, a center slash guard, uh, you know. Uh, you're going to need a role done a wide receiver at some point during this draft. I, I, I think as well too, to, to, to uh, make sure the offense has enough uh, uh, when, when Ben comes back and I'm with you, I, you know, worry about a quarterback when you don't have a quarterback now. Yeah. I, well, I think in 2021, you might look at it, but 2020 needs to be kind of an all in kind of year. Now here's the thing. Uh, you got, well, you, you, you probably, we'll see what happens with Mason Rudolph, whether or not he plays this week, but uh, you're going to have to make a decision next year. Next, during the offseason, can you get a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick to come in and, and be a, a, a double, you know, an extra cheap number two or number three? Uh, is there another backup quarterback around the league that at least could give a comp, compliment your defense? How's that? Yeah, uh, my question is how much do these guys cost? Because even for backup quarterbacks, those aren't super cheap, right? To, right, to, to right. Someone, but, so but can you afford it? But is there a Charlie Batch, uh, Bruce Gerkowski, uh someone that could put the 5.00 adjusted net stat up for you weekly? You know? uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there may be a real low-level veteran that I, I'm not thinking of right now, but I just worry about what that cost would be to sign a Fitzpatrick level. I think you might have to look at someone a tier even below that just to afford it and maybe just have a veteran that has a presence in that room. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, look, uh, obviously they have, uh, invested and, in, in, and at least Mason, it seems like might enter the off season on a positive note. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how week 17 goes. Who knows what the situation has been on. So unpredictable. Uh, let's see. Matt Palmer writes in time machine, Devin Bush. Hey guys, just to be clear, I'm perfectly happy with Devin Bush and his outlook, uh, future star and defense. Just, just carry for your take. This is going to be one of these hypotheticals, Alex, mm-hmm. knowing what you know now about this team and their offensive woes. If doc, if doc Brown pulled up in the DeLorean and gave Kevin Colbert the chance to go back to draft day, stay put and hold on to his into his pick so he could end up with a young tight end, Noah Fant, and a future pro bowler on the interior of, of the offensive line, and Dalton Risner along with 2023rd rounder. Does Colbert get in? Hell no, he doesn't. I don't think. Look, uh, I wasn't, I don't know what, where you were on Noah Fant. I think Noah Fant's uh, uh, going to be an okay guy, but I'm not, I'm not jumping into DeLorean to, uh, to go back and get Noah Fant and Dalton. Dalton uh, Risner uh, and and save that third rounder in 2020. 
Nope, I'm happy with, with what the Steelers did. Uh, no regrets there. Bush has uh, had a good year and going to be a really special player for years to come. Yeah, he goes on to say, of course, there's no way to predict uh, uh, Ben getting hurt. I'm not criticizing moving away. I just thought it was a fun question. Thanks for all you, all you do. Love the podcast. And I was like, look, I mean, once again, no no offense, Scott. You know, he had it. Uh, he had it in college. He's got the dropsies, you know. Uh, and mm-hmm. I, 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 how much have you seen of Dalton? I haven't watched a lot of him, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. No, I know that Broncos line hasn't played especially well. I don't know how well Reisner has or hasn't played. But again, just happy with Devin Bush, not looking to change that, not looking to imagine changing that. Uh, Exactly. And let's see, what else do we have here that we can get to? I lost my spot here. Uh, Let's see here. From... Matt writes in, Steelers, uh, should the Steelers look at running back in a, uh, if a good option is available in the second round? Uh, with how unreliable Connor is, consistently stay on the field, it seems like running back to, could be a, uh, regularly relied on would give the offense a boost. I, I don't think you go – personally, I don't think you go running back. Yeah, uh, it's, it, that, especially that high, I wouldn't do it. I mean, everyone's coming back next year. I mean, I get point taken, well taken about Connor's injury history that doesn't uh, – uh, I'm not overlooking that at all, but uh, just given the nature of the running back position, the other areas of need you're, you're going to likely need, need to address. Uh, maybe you do running back on day three, but I'm not spending a second round or even a third round pick on the position. Yeah, me either. Uh, uh, as far as that goes, I'm, I'm not worried about running back. That, that, that's down the list right now. Uh, hopefully these guys can start staying a little bit healthier here. Uh, let's see if I have anything else in here. I know I thought I did, but I, maybe I don't. Let's see. No, I think that's got most of them here. Uh, Alex, uh, anything else to add on this? Nope. Uh, just disappointing. Unfortunate. Two years in a row we're talking about end of season collapses where this team could have controlled its own destiny. And, again, this offense was even just below average. Uh, you'd be talking about a team that, that is winning in. But, unfortunately, that's not the case. Yeah, even if you had the Trent, a Trent Dilfer-like <laughs> yep. at, at, at this point. Uh, I think the saddest part is, man, when, when – uh, uh, they they probably thought they were going to get a little bit more from Mason than what they got uh, when they were ask, asking for it there in the middle of the season there, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and kind of wondering had he not gone through what he had gone through in the game against the Browns, maybe they maybe they get another win in there somewhere. I don't know. Uh, uh, but I mean, they did win obviously the first couple of games with, uh, with, with, with Devlin Hodges, uh, in there. So goal accomplished, uh, but boy, they sure needed to win, win at least one of these last two games and they didn't. So that's, yeah. that's why they are where they're at right now. So in the meantime, the all 22, I guess will be out later first thing in the morning here. So we'll get on that. We'll talk about that. We'll get our buddy, uh, uh, John Eisenberg in to talk about the, uh, the Ravens game, uh, We'll see. We'll cover the Mike Tomlin press conference. All he has to say on Tuesday, go over injuries and the other roster moves that, uh, uh, that that go on and start getting ready for the final week of the season, for the regular season here with our fingers crossed. So in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. You can follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to donate cut to the cause, uh, go to SteedersDepot.com and hit the donate button up right navigational bar. You can hit the PayPal and, and, and do it that way. Also, if you'd like an ad free version of the site, go to steedersdepot.com, hit the ad free button. And for one calendar year for $25, you can have an ad free version of the site. And that's been popular ever since we put instituted that o- over a year ago there. So, uh, in the meantime, thanks for all of those that listen. Sorry if we make you mad by going too long and, and maybe talking about the things that you don't want to talk about. But we got a full off season coming up uh, up here, so may- maybe uh, maybe you need a break from us, and, and we'll understand if you do need to uh, take a break from us. But in the meantime, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.